We are moving on now to top uh, do's and don'ts with experts. And um, Catherine Woods is an accomplished trial and appellate lawyer, uh, well poised to speak on this subject. She is associate counsel at Alexander Holborn. She was called to the bar in 1984 and appointed Queen's counsel in 2005. Her practice focuses on healthcare litigation and she defends hospital and nurses throughout British Columbia in medical malpractice claims with an emphasis on obstetrical malpractice. I can't think of a more qualified person to talk about dealing with experts than someone who deals in, in the medical field. She has taught medical legal ethics at the Faculty of Medicine at UBC. She's a member of the Medical Legal Society of BC and the past chair of the Insurance Law Section. Uh, she's listed as leading uh, medical malpractice lawyer in the peer-reviewed publication Best Lawyers in Canada and in the peer-reviewed Lexpert Legal Dictionary. And with that, I will turn it over to Catherine to talk about what we should and shouldn't be doing. <laughs> Thanks. I, I'm going to apologize in advance if some of what I'm going to tell you is repetitive because we've heard some, uh, some very great tips already today which you can incorporate in the, in the top ten ones that I'm going to review with you. But I think what's become readily apparent from listening to our, to our uh, wise speakers uh, who, um, who've come before me is that expert evidence uh, is often the single most important deciding fig, uh, factor uh, in civil litigation, and particularly in my field of medical malpractice, um, where expert evidence assumes monumental proportions. Um, it's a necessary element uh, in order for a plaintiff to succeed. And so from the outset, uh, as has been touched upon, counsel should consider what, if any, expert evidence is going to be uh, required. And that means not just from the perspective of liability, but from the all-important uh, aspect of causation. And we've had uh, a CLE recently uh, on causation, and we've, of course, had the Supreme Court of Canada pronouncements one after the other on that lately. But please don't ignore it. Uh, I find that there's a tendency uh, on plaintiff's counsel in particular in medical malpractice cases, not to really pay enough attention to causation. And there are experts out there who will, who will assist, especially on, in terms of scientific causation in medical uh, negligence cases. It's not enough to prove that the doctor might not have done what he should have done or she should have done. You have to prove uh, that it caused the injury or materially contributed to it. But uh, once you've sat down and mapped out uh, the expert evidence you think is going to be required, and that, of course, is dictated by the simple question, is this issue beyond the uh, ordinary knowledge of a judge and jury? And if it is, uh, use the case law as your, as your guiding factor. But generally speaking, if it is, you're going to need expert evidence. Um, and as, as I say, especially in medical law practice, I was quite interested because I actually hadn't seen that mammogram uh, case um, I'm, I have to read it to see if I actually agree with it, but, um, but I think that it's very important that you do have expert evidence on the standard of care in medical cases, and this mammogram uh, case is obviously a major exception to that and I think must be very fact-driven. Um, so here are the top ten uh, pointers. First of all, and this has been touched upon, make sure you have the expert with the right expertise. It's not going to help you if you have an engineer who has expertise in seismic upgrades if you want to have a seatbelt defense. Um, that could be, of course, subject to the challenge of the admissibility of the report in the first place. Although I do have to say, I've almost stopped trying. <laughs> I, every time I, I, I try to object to admissibility of reports, it's almost invariable that the judge will say it goes to wait. Um, uh, we used to, in the old days, object to, uh, to doctors commenting on nursing standard of care and nurses uh, talking about uh, medical standard of care. But I, I found over the years, especially in obstetrical cases where, where they're said to work as a team, uh, that everybody can say anything about anybody. So it goes to wait. Um, but, uh, but do make sure, uh, as much as you can, that your expert does have the appropriate expertise uh, in, in, in the area. Um, now, in terms of where you find them, Les has already told you some helpful uh, places to go. Uh, if you're plaintiff's counsel, the Trial Lawyers Association has a very, very good database. Um, there are all sorts of professional organizations out there, uh, some of whom have a stable of experts that they will um, uh, give to you uh, for hire. Be careful about them because sometimes they're not as, as, uh, as um, I don't know, professional as they could be, so do your homework. And Les has also pointed out that some of the case law can also give you some guidance. But, you know, I also have to say this. So many times, I mean, 
until, until Ms. Landy was was uh, chastised in the in the case that uh, he referred to in Jarman for gilding the uh, Cadillac. I had 25 years of Ms. Landy gilding the Cadillac <laughs> in almost every single case I ever had. And nobody ever said anything about it, even when time after time after time it was shown that the, uh, that the amount uh, that recommended for cost of future care was exorbitant. Judges would say nothing. Um, they wouldn't accept it. They'd go to the other expert, or sometimes they'd split the difference, which isn't terribly helpful if the difference is producing a really high number and <laughs> a reasonable number. But the, uh, but the problem is the courts really are reluctant to step in and say something when they've got a, uh, a, an expert who isn't really doing a professional job in front of them. It, it's a very rare circumstance indeed uh, that they're actually going to... Uh, to do anything about that. So, so to a certain extent, if you do have a case where an expert has been crucified, well, good luck using it next time, because then you'll say, oh, I wasn't at the case that in front of Mr. Justice Smith, he chastised you for being a gilder of Cadillacs. <laughs> it's not going to get you anywhere if, if the report in this particular case isn't gilding the Cadillac. So uh, it's, it's really of, of no moment, I think, as long as they've still got the appropriate qualifications. And believe me, we're continuing to see Ms. Landy um, on all our cases. Um, the other thing you should be aware of is uh, to avoid what I call the jack-of-all-trades. Um, there are certain doctors who hold themselves out as experts in every single field of medicine. Um, don't believe them. Um, the other thing to be aware of, and I think this was touched on earlier, is it, it, current practice. If you're now retired and decide you want to make your living uh, giving uh, uh, um, expert opinions, your, your longevity as an expert is going to be severely curtailed unless you're keeping up with the practice because you become increasingly irrelevant. Uh, so do make sure if you have a retired expert that he or she at least is still practicing in some aspect of the profession so that they're keeping current so they don't face the first question on crosses. Well, I know you haven't practiced since 1966, doctor. Are you uh, familiar with the current standards in, in obstetrics? Um, so, so be careful of that. Now, the other um, thing you have to do is, and we've gone over this and I can't emphasize how important it is, is provide your expert with the, with the factual assumptions. The single most important letter I draft in any case is my instructing letter to my expert. I have to be so careful when I do it that the facts that I'm providing to him or her are the facts that I can prove at trial. That's my responsibility. And you have to be very careful not to let your expert run off and find his own facts because then you're out there going, well, that's not one that I ever thought I was going to have to prove. So you have to tightly control that process. You have to say, I want you to rely on these facts and these facts alone. Do not go out on a limb without clearing it with me first so that I can say, okay, yes, I appreciate you need to have that fact too. I will ensure that I have that established at trial. So if you don't have those factual assumptions proved and less talked about in terms of the pillars, which I think is a good analogy. Um, some of the minor ones, um, like the color of the, of the baby's eyes, won't be relevant. But, but some of the major ones, including the cord blood gases, will be uh, hugely important. So make sure the hugely important ones uh, are going to be established on the evidence. And that leads me to the um, thorny issue. I still think it's a thorny issue of relying on discovery transcripts. I never used to do it. I absolutely would never send my experts copies of the discovery transcripts. If there was important evidence in the discoveries, I would summarize it. I would say the nurse's evidence is X, and I would summarize what she was going to testify about at trial. But always reluctant to give the discovery transcripts. And, and that could be because, because historically they weren't uh, used. And I had a case in front of Lowry uh, many years ago, as he then was, he's uh, now in the Court of Appeal, but uh, called Crouch and BC Women's Hospital, an obstetrical case, where he deplored the practice of giving experts discovery evidence. And perhaps in that case, it was because we had this expert obstetrician from California, and we'll get to the locality rule in a minute, um, coming up to testify against a very prominent perinatologist at BC Women's Hospital. Um, and his report basically just said, I find X. You know, this doctor was terribly negligent, blank. No factual assumptions at all, none. So, you know, it was one of those situations where how can you possibly get track how he, how he uh, led to his conclusion? But he did have the discovery transcripts. So the judge kind of went a little bit ballistic in his, and in his decision. I can't remember if it was an incorporated in the main decision or whether it was issued as a separate set of reasons. Essentially said, don't ever give them to the experts because you don't know what they're going to do with them. But over the years, 
Hinkson JA, as he now is, when he was counsel, would get apoplectic in, when he was defending doctors. I would be on for the hospital, he'd be on for the doctors. If the doctors who were criticizing his defendant doctors hadn't read his client's transcripts, and he'd use that as ammunition and cross say, are you, and he'd have this deadly voice in cross, are you telling me that you're sitting here challenging the professional reputation of your colleague and you didn't even look at his evidence about why he did what he did. Oh, oh, oh terrible, right? So, you know, <laughs> in those cases it became, I think, acceptable and plaintiff's counsel now invariably will uh, give their experts uh, the discovery transcripts in medical practice cases just to avoid the hinks and uh, cross-examination. <laughs> but do make sure if they do that that they, that they list that portion of the discovery evidence upon which they're relying. Now here's another warning. Don't send anything to your expert that you don't want disclosed in court because it will be. Um, in the old days, we had to wait till the expert took the stand before we got access to his file. And it, was, it would be a frantic leafing through it over the lunch break <laughs> to see what pearls you know, could fall out. Um, or smoking guns, preferably. And I had one such case. Uh, in fact, it's the Koju Karu case, which is a famous case for other reasons. Um, it's uh, Koju Karu in BC Women's Hospital, and we just got the decision from the Supreme Court of Canada not too long ago. And that was the case, it's infamous actually, about, quote, judicial plagiarism, where the trial judge uh, adopted as his reasons for judgment plaintiff's counsel's submissions. And uh, what was interesting about that was plaintiff's counsel's submissions were very circumspect about certain of the um, evidence at trial and ignored altogether this little thing that happened. And that <laughs> shows the danger, I think, of, of adopting counsel submissions because they craft them as they would wish you to see it and not as the evidence perhaps presented itself. But we got the file before the lunch break of a, an obstetrician from Ontario who was testifying against two BC Women's Hospital obstetricians. And Mr. Justice Wilcock, JA, who's now on the Court of Appeal, was counsel then for the doctors. And uh, we were frantically pouring through the file over lunch, dividing it up when we both had eureka moments. The draft report of this doctor um, <laughs> had included in it some extremely racist remarks about one of the defendants, which did not make his actual uh, report that was filed. And uh, also, with regard to the other doctor, had actually concluded that that doctor was not negligent and that he'd met the standard of care. And of course, that disappeared from the final report as well. <laughs> So, so I think it's fair to say that Mr. Justice Wilcock um, um, had the time of his life in cross-examination that afternoon. But for what? <laughs> it didn't even make the reasons, but that's true. Um, <laughs> the, fact, the, fact is, uh, the fact is that you have to be careful uh, what your experts are doing in, in the draft reports and what you're providing to them and what information is in the files because it can really, uh, really go sideways. Um, the other important thing is, uh, is getting all of the expert reports to the contrary to your experts. Don't just assume that you don't need to deal with that because there may be things in the other side's expert reports which your expert didn't deal with and that may be neutralized effectively, but you can't neutralize them unless you get a report in reply. Again, we used to be able to just lead reply uh, without notice, but uh, those nice times are gone and you're going to have to give those reports to your expert and if the expert has genuine issue with uh, the other side's uh, take on it then that, has, that hasn't already been covered in the original report has to be covered in a reply uh, report. And of course it's also important that you get those reports to your experts so they can give you uh, much needed advice on cross-examination uh, of the other side's uh, experts. Now. The other thing to be wary of is, is a couple of things. Don't have them produce a 150-page expert report if 10 pages is going to do. Certain experts are prone to be repetitive, and in one particular case, I believe the successful party was denied their costs of that, of that expert because of the added, uh, I don't know what, aggravation caused by, <laughs> by having to sort through pages and pages and pages of repetitive uh, expert uh, testimony. But, you know, obviously it has to be thorough, it has to address all the issues, but you don't have to go into a segue of the origin of, the, uh, of all the literature in, 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 in the world on a particular subject. 
um, in a report. So, I mean, just you look at it, you be the judge about whether it covers everything it does and, and excise the stuff that's just going to be um, repetitive and, and un unnecessary. And, and before I forget, let me just touch upon, because I don't think we actually have uh, the use of literature um, in cross-examination. Uh, in the Crouch case, the same one where Lowry got, uh, went ballistic about well, the use of discovery transcripts, he went um, ballistic about the use of literature because what was happening was we had a very prominent neonatologist on the stand and counsel for plaintiff was, was presenting him with article after article after article. He must have spent months in the library at a stack this high. <laughs> Are you aware of this one? No. Are you aware of this one? No. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't know a single one of these articles. You have to make sure they're authoritative and peer-reviewed before you use them uh, to cross-examine experts. So before you use literature, do be careful that, that they are, um, that it is rather leading um, uh, literature and not just, you know, some obscure study from, uh, from Australia that, uh, you know, was never properly endorsed. Um, that sort of brings me to the other issue, which is language. Um, do make sure, I mean, some of these reports can be highly technical, um, you know, especially some of the, um, uh, some of the uh, engineering uh, reports and, and medical reports. So try and make sure they use language which is accessible, because if the judge doesn't understand it, it's not going to help your case. Um, the other thing um, about that is we got actually slapped over the wrists in a, another obstetrical case we had in front of Mr. Justice Pitfield. That was Steinebach versus Fraser Health. And, you know, I think we tend to make too many assumptions about the knowledge level of, of judges, just assuming that they're going to absorb by I don't know, transmosis of things, or osmosis rather, what we already know so much of. Um, and he got really angry at the end of the case and essentially told us he hadn't, had, had, hadn't understood half of the evidence that was led. Um, and now that's a failure, counsel. You know, you, you should never take for granted that, that these complicated things are going to be understood. And one of the things he suggested, and the close of the case, and a little bit too late, uh, was, uh, was a glossary of terms. Uh, you know, if you can get together as counsel and just agree uh, on definitions of certain uh, complicated um, uh, language, then it gives them a resource that everyone's agreed on so you're not leaving them in, in, in the dark. Um, in terms of the literature, it, it really assumes tremendous importance in, in one particular area, and that's life expectancy. In life expectancy cases involving cerebral palsy, <clears throat> serious brain injury cases, um, and trauma, um, head trauma, the leading uh, life expectancy group is the Life Expectancy Project in California. Um, run by Dr. Strauss. So they, they have a huge database, just massive, the biggest in the world, uh, to study all of the factors that go into, uh, that go into um, how to calculate life expectancy, which is a huge issue in uh, personal injury claims because when you've got a catastrophically uh, injured, um, uh, injured plaintiff, obviously it's relevant how long they're going to live in terms of uh, how, many, how much they're going to get in terms of damages. Um, so that's where uh, literature becomes uh, very important. And we had a case called Kalon uh, versus uh, UBC Hospital, a catastrophically injured man, um, a CT scan which diagnosed uh, spinal meningitis, which, uh, or tuberculosis rather, which went into his brain before he was called back in for a CT with scot uh, contrast. But um, we had all the life expectancy experts relying on the same project. So you wonder why they came to such different conclusions. So, you know, it turned out that we had Strauss as our expert, and he produced for his report uh, a new study that had just been published by his group, in, not in a, in a journal like the New England Journal of Medicine, but in a textbook, which had been produced, I think, out of Harvard. So a very respectable textbook. So I thought, well, they've missed it. They've missed this new article. Yes. So let's go. Um, and then we present it. Uh, no, it's not peer-reviewed. I said, what do you mean it's not peer-reviewed? It's in the Harvard University leading text on this issue. Not peer-reviewed, won't accept it. So I just absolutely refused to take into account this new um, publication, even though it's by the very same authors they were relying on for their report. But you see, the next thing that happened, 
after that case, actually we ended up winning on life expectancy, losing on lots of other things. <laughs> Um, the, uh, the same experts used that chapter in their next reports. <laughs> and you think, okay, what do you do with that? And you know what? What you do with that, when it's not covered by qualified privilege, is you use it next time. You can take that evidence that's in open court and lead it again and cross to say, you never used it this time. You just this time. You, you so-and-so. But, so so you, can, uh, you can get some good ammunition uh, that way. Um, it, just touching back on Landy again, because it's under my heading eight, when you do get a cost of future care report, of course, the expertise of that expert is only limited to, okay, here is the nature of the injury, uh, the nature of the disability, here is what I, as a, as a rehab nurse, say uh, the value of it is. Uh, and that means you have to have supportive medical evidence for that cost of uh, future care opinion. And, uh, and that's often uh, where these things fall short. Uh, you have to comb through it and say, okay, which part of this recommendation is medically supported and which isn't. Uh, so that's an important factor to remember. Um, locality. It used to be, we used to be able to say, I'm sorry to sound like this is the used to be days, but we used to be able to say, if you're from Powell River, you're entitled to have a Powell River uh, doctor comment on your standard of care. Well. That was a little bit much, but now, now, um, you really, I, we face doctors from all over uh, North America uh, coming up to, to testify against Canadian doctors. And it's, again, good luck objecting. It just doesn't, it doesn't work. I mean, that one exception of the, uh, of the Chinese uh, ophthalmologist was really not because he was from China, where ophthalmology isn't all that different, but because he literally had, had no idea of the standards of practice here because he wasn't really asked to do that. He was there as a, as a more of a causation expert, so the standard of care issue was a sideways uh, um, kind of um, issue. But the, the fact is that we had in that Steinebeck case um, an obstetrician from Oregon um, coming up to testify. And the thing is, you know, you just look at him and you go, gun for hire, gun for hire, you're just doing this for the money, you don't know these guys, you're just up here to just be here. And it's interesting because the judge didn't make one reference to his opinion in the reasons for judgment. So, you know, although technically speaking, the, you know, it's admissible and there they are, I think the weight is pretty low if you're getting an obstetrician from Oregon when there are so many obstetricians in Canada that could you know, be available to testify. It's different if you're talking about a unique expertise. If there's something that's you know, really, really specialized and only a certain handful of experts are doing it, well, of course, then you get the leading experts who might come from you know, Texas or wherever. But in a regular run-of-the-mill kind of standard of care opinion, you really should be able to go local. And by that, I mean Canada. I mean, we face experts from Alberta and Ontario all the time. But, but the U.S., we, we do pull back a bit and wonder why that is. The... The other thing to think about is how many experts, and this is really starting to bug me, because in the old days, again, we used to have one expert on every topic, you know, you'd have one. Now, the, the, the most recent case I have, we have ten experts saying the same thing on, on, on one issue. Now, number one, I suppose you can deal with it by depriving them of costs of unnecessary experts, but if they genuinely are intending to call all of those experts on the same point. I would think the danger of that is you might get a lot of inconsistent evidence on cross that's going to undermine your case. So the more experts you call to say the same thing, I think the m more danger you're presenting yourself with. So do try to resist the, the concept that there's safety in numbers. I think you just need one good expert on each area that you have to cover and not a whole bunch. And the problem is it's adding inordinately, of course, to the length of trials. Again, we used to be able to do these cases in two weeks. Now we're doing them in, you know, three months. So try and rein in and realize that it's actually better for your case if you restrict the number of experts to those you need rather than having repetitive experts on the same point. And the other thing, too, is that we do have a tendency to get the really good experts snapped up early. Um, so you, when you get a file in, don't wait the first thing you should do is get the experts hired because um, otherwise you're, you're then left floundering. I always get very upset if some of my, my favorite experts are already uh, taken 
And um, you then have to go, well, what am I going to do now? And you end up often having to go out of province. So you have to utilize resources of, of, of fellow lawyers in, in other provinces to try and give you recommendations um, for experts there. And it's always, especially if you get used to over the years working with a really good team of experts to, to try and introduce another uh, one, it gets it just a bit more problematic. So, so do, do look um, to retain your experts early. So I think that probably enough tips from me about what to do with your uh, expert retainers, but, uh, but really it, it is such an important aspect of your case, you really should be very careful with it. Thank you, Catherine. I uh, hate to cut you off. I feel like you were just hitting your stride. <laughs> <laughs> but we do have some time for questions for Catherine, if anyone has anything. And for Wendy. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, I, uh, yes. Again, this may be a simple question because my background is criminal. Um, with this new rule, um, with the experts, I mean, my experience is with expert witnesses, you're far better to present them in person and, you know, to, to have that evidence before the court. That's, as I say, my background is criminal. But this new rule, as I understand it, you present the, the, the opinion in written form and that's it. Unless they challenge it, you don't get that opportunity. And can you, is the thinking just a shortened trial or, or what's the thinking on that? And, uh, I think that the reason for that probably goes back to that overriding, overarching principle, which is to not surprise people at trial. And when you have an expert coming to do more than clarify, so some you are allowed to call your wit witness to clarify technical terms, a very limited amount of testimony they can give. Uh, but I think probably the rationale is that um, if you if the opinion in writing is just kind of a, a springboard for the the expert to come in the stand and introduce a whole bunch of new opinions that haven't been notice hasn't been given of, then that defeats the purpose of the rule. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we've always had to be pretty restrictive in how we deal with our experts and really limit it to clarification of technical points that, you know, maybe there's some technical terms in there, something that just needs to be clarified to make sure it's clear to the, the judge. Uh, so it's not really much of a change from prior practice, it's just codified more. Thank you. Uh, one of the things that I've uh, found, and I maybe um, either one of you, Catherine, um, or Wendy could comment on, and, th and that is ensuring the neutrality of the expert. Um, I've found in the past that it's been very helpful to explain to the experts over and over again, you're there to help the court. Tell me the bad as well as the good. Because quite often these experts um, know a lot more about the area than you will ever know, <laughs> and um, and they can tell you quite early on when there's something going to come up and surprise you or or go the wrong way. And it's very useful to know very early on whether or not you're going to get an adverse opinion, or that expert can't provide you with an opinion that will be of assistance, or that these are things you have to to watch out for. Um, I always know the bad. Yeah. Always, it's you know, and I, you know, if I have a bad case, I have a bad case, and I'm not going to make. I will never compromise an expert to ask him to give an opinion mm -hmm. that I know will not be a be, be a true one or, or one that they try and and accommodate my my case. I, I mean, if I know I'm dead in the water, I'm dead in the water. I won't taint the expert by asking for a standard of care report. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, you know, if you're dealing with your experts early before you've even pleaded the case, if you're on the plaintiff's side. You know, as you say, they, they know a lot more than you do. And, and so often in discussion, as you're trying to kind of understand what went wrong in this case, they may actually take you in a direction that you hadn't thought of. Uh, so it's really important to have those conversations and understand. So they may say, you're, you're going down this track, but I can tell you uh, that's okay. But there's an, a pro there is a problem that this is what the problem is and that you may not have appreciated that because you're not in that area. All right, thank you. Uh, There's a question over there. Oh, sorry. Uh, I've got a question about um, the context of personal injury trial, the line between uh, admissibility and weight of an expert report. Um, is it fair to say that in practice the court would be more willing to simply admit uh, a report and revisit the issue uh, by, by 
can, by putting it off as an issue of weight after the fact, uh, after the cross-examination is heard? I think it would depend on what the basis for objection was. So in some of the cases that I was referring to where they were not complying with the rules, uh, that may be a reason to have the report taken out altogether. If it's um, a question, so there, the reason I raised that hearsay um, point in my paper was there, there was a case that went to the Court of Appeal where the judge had excluded a report because there was an objection made on hearsay and the Court of Appeal went through the, it's a, it's a great case and you should read it, we go through my paper and find it, but it's a good case because it does talk about, look at this is a weight issue, the, a court, an expert is allowed to rely on hearsay, it's you as counsel that needs to deal with what those hearsay points are in the opinion and some of that has to be proven and some of it doesn't have to be proven depending on what it is. So if it's, this, if it's literature, it doesn't need to be proven. If, um, if you attack that expert in cross-examination and show that that literature is not authoritative or something, then that's obviously going to go to the weight of the opinion. So it, it really would depend, I think, on the objection that's being taken as to whether the judge is going to admit it or exclude it and, or just assess the weight to be given to it. If I can jump in, I also think the context has a lot to do with it, and that will be everything from the type of case it is, whether or not it's in front of a judge or a judge and jury. Uh, who the judge is, quite frankly, judges have certain tendencies uh, that we all know about. Uh, and the other thing is it depends on how the objections are framed. I think if you're objecting to the admissibility of an expert report and you have a valid objection, and it goes to one of those uh, yes, no, bright line issues that are outlined in the first stage of the Abbey test, mm -hmm. uh, that a trial judge is going to have a great deal of difficulty saying, yeah, it doesn't satisfy this particular criterion, but I'm going to admit it anyway. So if you have an objection that goes to one of those fundamental things, for example, uh, whether or not the, um, the expert is qualified, um, whether or not it's uh, relevant in some way, uh, that kind of issue, you have a much better chance if you articulate the objection and focus it on one of those first uh, things at the first stage of the Abbey test. A, a trial judge is not going to have a whole lot of wiggle room, but on the other hand, if it's at the second stage, then it's a matter of discretion. Uh, it's a mixed question of fact and law, and uh, you have an argument to be made, and it could go either way. Thank you. All right. 